Hey, Eric, how's it going? It's good. How are you? Pretty good. Glad to hear. Yep. And Randy, are you there? Hey, yeah. Excellent. This isn't your first time, right? You've, you've been here before. Yeah. Uh, okay. A couple times in the past and just last week. Okay, that's what I thought. I just want to make sure. Cool. Yeah, I apologize. I, you know what? I, I meant to send out a note reminding people that we now have a password. Hopefully that didn't mess you guys up. Caught me for a second. Mm -hmm. I had to go to the spec. Yeah. <sighs> busy, busy day. Hey, Tommy. Hey, Tamer. Hey, Doug, how are you? Good. And Randy? I'm sorry, not Randy. Yeah, Ryan. <laughs> or Andy. Sorry, getting you guys mixed up. Ryan, you there? Hello. Yep. Hello, sorry. Uh, Mr. Mark, you there? Hi, Doug. Hello. Matthias, you there? Matthias, you there? Mr. Clemens, you there? I have arrived, indeed. Excellent. I have arrived. <laughs> Hi, this is Matthias. Sorry, I was Hello. Late. And we're so excited that you're here, Clemens. Oh, boy. Hey, Lucas. Hello. <sighs> Morning, David. Good morning, Doug. I knew someone was going to ask me, what's the password? Seven, 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 seven. <laughs> Something like that, yeah. Five sevens. Yeah. It's the first time it's, it's first time it's actually done this to me. It's actually required a password. They just turned it on like uh, earlier this week or late last week, something like that, yeah. I'm not quite sure why. Hey, Ginger. I was very confused that the link disappeared from the README page because that's what I've been using. What did I do? Just point you to the agenda doc instead? Ginger, are you there? Yes, I am. Thank you. All right, cool. <laughs> All these new security features. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's wonderful. I have to admit, I keep hearing about them turning on security features or all these other conference calls and stuff because, you know, bad things happen at times. I have yet to be on one that actually does something weird. Just once I'd like to actually see it for myself. Not that I actually really want to, other than just, just got a morbid curiosity kind of more than anything else. <laughs> I, have, I, sure. have been, I, have, I have been Zoom bombed once and that was the most disgusting thing I've ever seen. It was terrible. 
I really? was going to say, I'm sure we could get somebody to Zoom bomb if you really want. <laughs> no. I, not well, we, need to, we need to liven this call up a little bit. <laughs> that would definitely do it, yes. Yeah, I, I'm not, I'm not going to tell you what happened, but it was, it was awful. It was traumatizing. And th so I'm very glad that they're doing that. Interesting. So off offline, you're going to have to tell me what exactly you saw, because I don't obviously want it on a real Zoom call, where it's, especially where it's recorded. But like I said, morbid curiosity. I just, because yeah, I'm expecting the probably, usual stuff. I'm expecting the usual Google stuff it. like, say that again? You could probably Google it. I'm sure there'd be lots of stuff. On no, there. see, see that'd be different, right? Because that then you're going to get some really sick stuff. But, <laughs> you know, stuff that you got from a CNCF call, I was hoping wouldn't be too bad, you know, the, the normal stuff you might expect, you know, swearing or just interrupting or even, even porn you might almost expect. But Clement, it sounds like you're talking about stuff that's even more disgusting. Uh, it was terrible. I, I, mean, I don't want to think about it. <laughs> okay, I apologize for the slight diversion there. Let's go but back there to are, the but there are there are There are Reddit uh, groups and 4chan groups where kind of open Zoom chats are being posted and the kids just go and, and storm them. Wow. Okay, let's get back to the fun. We're, we're at time anyway. So Lance, are you there? Yes, I'm here. All right, and Michael. I'm Michael Dekmitzen. <laughs> I apologize, I butchered that, I'm sure. Michael? Okay, what about Thomas? Hello, everybody. Hello, Hunkui? Uh, hi. Hello. All right, uh, we'll circle back around with that stuff again later. Let's get on with the fun stuff. All right, community time. Anything from the community people would like to bring up? That's not on the agenda. All right, not hearing any. <clears throat> Excuse me. We do have an SDK call this week. Um, let me just double check. I don't think we have anything on the agenda, but let's just let's see. Yeah, nothing on the agenda. So if we don't have anything by the end of this call, we may just cancel that call. Although I do wonder whether this question here from Grant is an SDK issue or not. So we'll talk about that one later. Uh, Discovery Interop, uh, not this week. Uh, just a reminder, we did agree November 2nd for our Interop, so please take a look at the Interop doc itself, uh, help fill it out, and start coding away. All right. Uh, Timur, anything you want to mention from the workflow side of the house? Yeah, thanks, Doug. Uh, from the workflow side, we finally finished all the logo stuff. We updated the website. CNCF pages are updated, uh, GitHub repos. Um, so yeah, I want to thank Scott Nichols also for saying that the logo looks like an open source USB logo. <laughs> that was funny actually. <laughs> but um, other than that, from the spec side itself, we are kind of trying to enforce open API uh, for some sort of a service invocation. So we're going through that and trying to figure out uh, if we should start preparing or not for the KubeCon NA stuff, if we're getting project office hours again and stuff like that. So that's it. All right, cool, thank you. Any questions for him? All right, before we jump into PRs and stuff, any other topics people wanna to add to the agenda? Or that we should, that should be talked about before this? All right, let's jump into it. <clears throat> Wait a minute. Okay, so this one um, is from me. Um, I don't wanna vote on it today, even though it's it was put out there before Tuesday, um, mainly because I think it needs a lot of thought put into it. Um, basically what I did is, uh, first I tweaked the asynchronous text to make it a little bit more generic. There was a little too much logic in there about what to do in certain situations and I found myself repeating text that really was already described in the synchronous response case. So I basically just said, the async should look almost exactly like the synchronous case. You're just getting the result from a different endpoint. So I, I tweaked that a little. Hopefully I didn't mess anything up. So please take a look at that. Um, I did change it so that post can take a list of services instead of just one. Um, and I'm very nervous about this because I think doing a post one at a time, especially if you're doing some sort of like mass import is just a real pain in the butt. I think having the ability to do a batch upload is very important. Um, however, that introduces a whole bunch of interesting problems. Like what if one of them fails? You know, do you kill the whole thing or do you just terminate or just say that one failed and let everything else go through? Um, I took a very much a all, or, all or nothing kind of approach to it because I didn't want to get into partial error reporting type stuff. But even aside from that, you then have to figure out, well, how do you tell the caller what the various IDs are 
for all the things that were created. So I have a mechanism to return that in the response, but I had to worry about uh, whether the response is going to be too large or not, because then you get into pagination. So I decided to go with just returning the list of IDs in the same order which the post came in on. So lots of interesting choices I made. I'm not convinced they're all necessarily right. So please look that section over in particular. Um, I'd like to get some feedback on it. I also explicitly pulled out the support for import to be separate from the normal put and post operations. I think before this PR, I basically said you could do a put or a post and then you could put like a query parameter there. And inside that same description, I describe how you handle import versus a normal put or post. And I found that I was jumbling up the text a lot. I thought it was a little bit hard to follow. So I decided to pull out the import logic, meaning the query parameter, into completely separate APIs. So that way we can talk just about import separate from a normal put or post. And I think that makes it easier to, to read, okay? Um, if people want, I can obviously scroll through this and, and, and talk to anything in particular, but let me just go ahead and stop there and ask if there are any high level questions. And keep in mind, like I said, I don't want to vote on this today. I think we need a lot more thought process put into this besides just this quick review. So let me pause there. Nothing? Okay. In that case, I'm assuming that means most people did not have a chance to review it because I doubt everybody is violently agreement with what I wrote there. <laughs> so I'm going to assume you guys just need more time to review it. Clemens, you keep coming off mute. Is there something you want to say? Um, yeah, I, found, I, I looked at the I, think there, I looked at the associated bug, but not the uh, but not the PR. Um, I think this this idea with the import is. Um, is good. Um, I, I'm I'm generally leaning towards pulling these sorts of of um, like come, go, walking up to a service and changing 500 things. Um, it's a little strange to me, and I would rather want that service to go to the source and pull. Um, so I'm not sure whether I like the whole notion of kind of this bulk push at all. But if if um, but that's that's I will admit that that's taste. And um, so I think the solution you have here to say there's a way to go and do inserts where you are assigning numbers and then you do effectively replication where you keep the all the, the numbers where client giving you something and then you go and, and take ownership of it or another service giving you something and you want to go and retain the entire shape of it. Um, I think this, that distinction is good. Yeah, I, but I, I, have not, I have not reviewed all the text. Okay, that's fine. Um, I, didn't, I, I, I did notice your comment about the, the push versus pull. Um, and that, I thought that was interesting because I hadn't thought about that. Do you think that in, in all cases where there's going to be the equivalent of some sort of batch upload of stuff that the discovery endpoint will always be able to reach out to the to the source of that bulk mm, it might not yeah well it might not be yeah, that, that's right. the one thing that worries me about that because it yeah. certainly would be easier if you could pull it right then you don't have to worry about partial success and partial failure type stuff right Okay, but something to think about because I, 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 it is an interesting approach I hadn't thought of. Yeah. Okay. Any other comments, questions? Okay. So I'll just assume people need time to review it, which obviously was my plan. So please, in particular, you know, read over the batch stuff. Um, that's the part that worries me most. I think most everything else is fairly straightforward, at least I think, if I remember correctly. Okay. I'm not hearing any other questions, comments. We'll move, we'll keep moving through the agenda. Doug, could I ask one thing? Of course. Um, something that uh, has sort of been rolling around my head since last time. Um, can you sort of describe the thought process between the, the post approach where you have this kind of non item potent, you know, server backend um, assigning the identity to versus a, like, a, like a put approach where, you know, you have more of an item potent. You know, you can do it over and over and over again, and the identity is stable. And if you've got a distribution, 
Um, it's very easy to reconcile versus multi-master updates in a kind of a post world. Yeah, so my mind, so let's ignore the import case for a sec. In my mind, I, I keep it very simple. To me, post is for create and put is for update, okay? Because if you ignore the import case, then you're, when you're talking about um, a brand new service being added to the discovery endpoint, my assumption is that it does not have an ID yet, so it's a brand new thing and you're just sticking it in there. And therefore, post is the right way to go. Put is when you already have an ID associated with it, so you're just gonna be updating that resource. Now, import throws an interesting twist into that whole thing, right? Because with import, you wanna keep the ID that you had before. And that's why, as part of my PR here, the difference between put versus post for import, I think is very, very slim. They're almost the exact same thing, I think, in most cases. Um, and that's something else that I wasn't 100% sure of, to be perfectly honest. Um, and the reason I, I, I kind of did it that way is because I was trying to make it as easy as possible on the user of the system, right? So for example, somewhere in here, I talk about how on a post, for, yeah, I think on a, on a normal post, not for the import case, you, you can include an ID and um, uh, an, e, uh, an epoch value, and they'll be ignored, right? Even though they're gonna be ignored, I allow them to be in there because I wanna make it easy for somebody to do a get to one discovery endpoint, maybe basically an export, and then turn around and, and do a create on this other discovery endpoint and not have to go through and modify the entire chunk of, of JSON to remove all these fields that are just gonna get ignored, right? I want their life to be easy, right? So I'm not sure I'm completely answering your question, but those are the kind of things that were running through my head as, as, going, as I was writing this up. And to, to your original question though, to me, put versus post is create versus update. That's, that's what it really comes down to for the most part. Does that so help? I have a, a slightly different view on that. Like I agree uh, that in general, that's how they work. Um, but when you think about like, where is the, where is the entity being created? Who, who is responsible for the creation of the, the entity and who's identifying it? If it's, if it's the client that needs to be able to maintain stability of that ID across a set of masters, um, then the, the, the notional object is being created by the client. And of course, put is item potent. And so I can put that ID over and over and over again. I don't end up creating multiple things, um, even when I'm doing that across multiple masters. And in a distributed scenario, I just wonder if that wouldn't simplify some of the challenges for reconciling and, and things like that. And, and yeah, you know. Yeah, so that's interesting because I think on, on what I put in here, I think I do support that notion where basically what you're saying, if I understand you correctly, is the client kind of picked the ID, right? And I think you can do that today with what I have here, even through a put, but you have to tell us it's an import, right? Because by default, I, I assume put is more of an update. So if the object doesn't already exist, it's going to give you an error saying, you know, 404. But if you give us the import flag, then, it, then we're basically saying, okay, yeah, this ID is, you know, doesn't exist in the system. We'll create it for you and we'll use the ID you passed in, right? But I think what's interesting is, if, if I understand it, you're kind of touching on something that's a bigger topic, which is either where's a source of truth or who actually owns these things, right? And we haven't actually touched on that yet. And I think that's a good topic because I don't know the answer. I'm, I'm, I've been kind of assuming that each discovery endpoint thinks it's the source of truth, at least for the stuff that it knows about. I'm not 100% convinced that's right. Yeah, interesting area of thought for sure. Yeah, <laughs> and, and of course that then goes into some of the stuff I mentioned in Slack around this stuff, right? As I was coding this up, I kind of did Scott's little sample that he showed us last week or the week before, right? We had a ring of discovery endpoints, each uh, treating the, the, the next guy in the chain as, uh, as upstream, right? So he keeps querying his list and, and you could see services propagate through the ring. Well you know, depending on how you choose to do the propagation or who chooses to query who at what point in time, you can get into really weird situations where somebody deleted a service from one endpoint, but then that, that service doesn't get deleted through the entire ring, rather it gets recreated because, because the one you just deleted it from ends up querying another guy that says, hey, what do you have? And he says, oh, I, had, I don't know about that one that you have because I don't have it, even though it just got deleted. So he ends up recreating it thinking the other guy recreated it or the other guy created it fresh, right? So you, you get into really weird situations and I wasn't, I don't know what to do about those things yet. 
So those are things I want to talk about at some point. So, okay, any other questions or comments? Okay, so as I said, please, please look this one over. Um, I'm not so much concerned about getting this one soon because of anything other than I want people to know what to code up for the interop because I know people are very short on time and very, very busy. So I'm trying to keep the spec changes down to a minimal or get them in as soon as possible. That's my reason I'd like to get this one in sooner rather than later. Not because I want to close down the discussion. So please do get a chance to review it if you can. That way people can start coding it up. Okay, thank you all with that one. Um, Lance, I hope you're okay. I wanted to talk about your question because I thought that would be a good one. We didn't have a whole lot on the agenda anyway. Are you okay with talking about this one? Yeah, I'm fine. I added it to the um, SDK agenda, but um, we can talk about it here. Okay. It me, did you have an issue or just let me where is SDK? Because if there actually is an issue, then there may be a spec issue to, to fix. So, okay, I'll let you talk about it. So this is the issue for everybody that's looking. So the, 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 a, <laughs> the situation is that um, it's possible to receive an event that has a um, database 64 property indicating that the data itself is binary. Uh, and has a data content type of application JSON. So is it legitimate, is it against the spec for uh, an SDK to um, recognize that it's binary data, decode the binary data in JavaScript that then it is just a buffer which can be a string and I can then if I know the data content type is application JSON, I can parse that JSON if I would like to and turn it into an object. And is that legitimate? Is that purely an SDK question? And would it be contrary to the specification to actually receive an event that has a database 64 and a content type of application JSON? Jim, your hands up. Yeah, so I, I, um, I was trying to understand what, what Lance was, was talking about in the chat yesterday. So I think you, my, my thought is that an SDK would need to support that. But okay. having said that, I don't think an SDK should ever produce events like that because that doesn't seem to be in the spirit of, of, um, of the spec. Right. So whether that's a spec guidance, um, I don't know. But I, I think for completeness, it should... Um, except stuff that looks like that. That, that would be my opinion. I, I stumbled on this literally because um, a bunch of the original tests in the SDK, the JavaScript SDK were written but um, with binary data that was actually just JSON that had been converted to a binary buffer. Scott, here you so, go. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, comments. I think you're, yeah, I forgot you were trying to speak earlier, and then we have a, then we'll get to Scott. Yeah, so, sorry, I'm I'm not good with the hand hand raising. Um, yeah, so that's a that's a legitimate way to to encode um, anything that is not um, encoded in the same uh, encoding. So I mean, there's JSON JSON in, needs to be in UTF-8, etc. But you could have the situation where, but it's representable in all kinds of different character sets. So you could have a situation where the outer and the inner um, character set don't uh, don't match, um, and and the same is true for if you want to carry XML data. That might also be while well, that's text. If that is encoded in a different way with a different character set, then you would also carry that as binary. So so I think the combination that you mentioned in the beginning, like it's binary, but it's it it's a text format. So I need to go in and first run that through a character set decoder. Did anybody else lose Clemens? Did we just lose him? Nope. Yes. Clemens? Clemens, yeah. you still there? Uh, yeah. you, oh, can, yeah. Clemens, you cut out for about 15 seconds. Something is wrong with my network. So let me say that again. So if you find that the, the, the binary, um, that you have binary and you have a, uh, an encoding for the payload that, or data content type that indicates that it's text, then you run that through 
the character, uh, character encoding or decoder, um, presumably UTF-8, unless the, the content type says something else, and then you uh, deal with the text. So that's a legitimate representation just as, just as data is. Okay, class, your hand up. Yeah, it's probably not about application JSON, but uh, in general for other uh, types, an SDK might not always be able to determine um, if it's binary or text. So if it gets an, um, a message in binary mode and, and has to determine then for forwarding it in, uh, in structured format, um, it, it sometimes may have to, to guess or apply some kind of uh, heuristics or something. And I, I discussed this with Alan, I think last year around that time. And so there might be cases when you have to be ready to, to receive events uh, where the payload is either uh, in binary or in text form, depending on the heuristics the according SDK has applied. Okay, Scott, your hands up. This is, this feels similar to the question we had uh, maybe six months ago around, is it like, how do you do a wrapped binary thing with a, a JSON event inside of it? Is that anywhere close to that? Hmm. Or are we talking be. about like actual binary data inside the payload? I think it's interesting because I think in this case, it, it is text data, it's just base64 encoded. Right, Lance? Yeah, oh, I, I see. But, I, your, but your use case is interesting, Scott. I hadn't thought about that. No, we did think about it. We, we had a discussion. We did. Yeah, but I, mean, I just think the correlation is interesting. I hadn't thought about it. Oh. Um, I, in this case, I think uh, the SDK would reject it. It's not a valid cloud event, and it's not, it's not encoded in the correct way. What, what makes it invalid? It doesn't follow the normal parsing rules. Why is that? No, it, it doesn't. It's, it's, I think it's fine because data base 64 does not contain JSON. It contains binary. And then you are, um, from, from, a, from a client, the client is just giving you a byte array and says, here's the content type. It really leaves it to the application what to do with it. Yeah, it seems like this, I think, I think Jim might have described it best when he said it, it's legal, but really funky, yeah. my, in my words. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. But I think, Lance, I'm not sure you got a direct answer to your question about what should an SDK do with it. But, but let's, let, let's, 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 let's pretend that the event comes over an Avro, then it's clear. As soon as you have a proto or an Avro event, there is no question what the, what the solution to this is. Because if it's binary, then then the content will all. Clemens, and, Clemens, wait, you, you cut out there again for about five seconds. Okay. So so if if the if the event is Avro or Proto, and the payload is binary and uh, it says content types is application JSON, you know what to do. Right, and and, and like in the spec, it says. You know, if the data is binary, there must be a base a database 64 property. Then in the next sentence, if I remember correctly, it's the next sentence. It says, if there's a data property and a data content type that is of a type that the SDK knows how to parse, it should be parsed. So as, mm -hmm. as soon as I... Uh, um, convert from base 64 into quote binary. Um, I then have a data field and a um, data content type field that I know what to do with. It's, it seems legit to me, but it was just a weird case that I came across when I was kind of going through the JavaScript SDK tests. So no, no one's hands up, so I'll raise mine. It seems to me that an SDK that receives this at a bare minimum should treat the, the data of the event as binary. 
the fact that it has a, a data content type of application JSON is interesting, but does not change the fact that this thing came across as binary data. And therefore, if the SDK has the notion of, 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 of a binary blob just being passed on as a binary blob, then it should I mean, as, as the bare minimum. Whether it then tries to be smart and say, oh, because the content data content type is application JSON, I'm going to try to parse this as JSON and then pass it on as a text thing or as a JSON object. I think that's a nicety that it may choose to do if it can, but if that for some reason fails, I think it needs to drop back to be straight binary. Right. But then I think you also need to be very clear with your, with your readers or your users that you're gonna be doing this magic under the covers for them and almost offer them the choice of not doing the magic. Hmm. But I don't know. Jim? Another side issue here. Um, I believe for us to claim compliance with this spec as a, as a service provider, we have to support JSON format. You know, that's, I think, one of the sort of ground rules. Um, so I, I guess it's very non-idiomatic for, for me to expect us to be able to process JSON payloads where JSON is not in the data. It's, it's been funkily put into some um, base 64 scheme for some reason. I, I guess it just, it sort of unravels the string a little bit from an event handling perspective. And how what does what is being JSON format compliant actually mean, I guess, in that case? Does it mean I understand every single uh, weird way that um, an event might be represented. Hmm. So Lance, let me ask you this. It, I'm wondering whether, I, I, let me phrase this. So we keep talking about this being sort of an odd case, but I'm actually starting to wonder whether it's not. Because today, if you use the data attribute and you put JSON in there and the content type is application JSON, everything's fine. But when the user gets that data, it's going to be a JSON object, but there's really no guarantee that that JSON is formatted the exact same way that the user or that the client sent it. And by, by that, I mean spaces and everything, right? So what if the use case here is someone wants to guarantee that the exact formatting for their JSON payload, space for space, new line for new line, is the exact same that the receiver is going to get. Therefore, they don't want any middleware knowing that it's JSON to do any weird funky formatting on it. And they want to make sure it gets passed through as is byte per byte. Therefore, they're gonna pass it as binary. Is that a valid use case for this scenario? Yeah, and in that case, I think I should not do what, uh, what my inclination was, which is to parse it as application JSON and or, you know decode the binary, binary, parse it as application JSON and then have a, you know, basically an object as the data. Yeah. So in that case, the thing you get back is a string of the base 64 encoded data. But what we're really talking about is the payload was a, a JSON string, not, and, and the, the cloud event wrapper knows nothing more. And it's up to the consumers to understand how to turn that back into whatever it's supposed to be. I, I would actually say in that case, you give back a, a buffer. You, you yeah. The SEK wouldn't try and turn it back into a string. You, you're really saying this is a byte array uh, yeah. and here's the byte array and here's the content type that was given for it. Yeah. Right. You, and you can that, do that if it's in the data field. You can do that if it's in the database 64 field. Well, that was the only way you, I see, I've always thought from an SDK perspective, if, the da, if it's in the data field, that's the JSON value. So why not just give back a JSON value? Well, the JSON value in that case would be a, the string of the base 64 encoded uh, binary block. Well, I mean, again, I wouldn't consider it a string. I would just consider it a JSON value. It, it's an object, yeah. But it's, but it's invalid as, as part of that data field. It has to be a, JSON, a valid JSON object. It can't be bytes because it has to be able to um, go between structured and binary format. Yeah, I mean, it has to be a JSON value. So it could be a string. It could be the word true. It could be, it doesn't have to be an object. Yeah, that, that's right. That's right. Um, I, I'll observe that there are overwhelmingly um, server plumbers in here. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
and, and we try to be really smart, um, there's an intent expressed by the publisher of that event. And, they, and the, the, the publisher says, this is binary. And, and then they use the data content type as the hint for what that binary contains. And that hint is for the ultimate receiver of that event. And I don't think the middleware has any business in futzing with that. But would this be preserved in all cases? Um, yes. If that's, if that's converted to an HT binary and back then to structured. Yeah, that's, that's, that's why we did the basics. We did data underscore base 64 we, because we had no other way of distinguishing true binary in JSON from, from, from strings. And that's why we had this. It's an annotation. Of yeah, the sure. But in this spe specific case, if you yes. have this JSON as data base 64 and you send it on in a binary mode, is then still this uh, expression of, of sending it as binary is still preserved? Yeah, absolutely. Because, oh. because they, we're, converting, we're converting from, we're converting this into binary in our kind of in, in memory model. That's why we have types. And then if you're sending this on as, as HTTP, as an HTTP uh, uh, binary type, then you're just mapping the binary into the, into HTTP binary. And then you, you yeah, but, also back out as, as such. But in HTTP binary, it would get content type application JSON and the um, base 64 decoded uh, value would be in the body, so. That's correct, yeah. Yes. But then this, uh, and, and if you would then convert it back to structured, this um, it wouldn't be binary anymore. It would be just in the data attribute usually. Aren't you talking about a different scenario? Well, I, I, that's an interesting scenario, yeah, because when it, when it, if it comes in in binary mode and it wants to go out in structured mode, you know, you've got two options then. You can either just, jam it into the binary field or you can look at it and go oh it's json therefore i can drop it in the data attribute directly i think that's that's the this this translation use case but but then but then uh json but then we can we can lean back on the json you, you um, cut out a, wait hey clemens you cut out again for about five yeah, seconds I have, I'm, I'm having network issues that are weird <laughs> um has microsoft so, had any issues this week Sorry, that was a dig there. <laughs> uh, the, um, um, yeah, we can, for that, however, we can lean on the JSON spec and say, well, JSON is exactly what's in the spec and, that, and whether you encode that as binary or whether you encode that, um, um, like, like the, the, the preserve character by character thing um, and with the right indenting is not JSON, right? That is, it doesn't preserve. It doesn't preserve the the new lines and etc. by by default. You can reformat. It's still the same document. And I also feel like the the scenario that Klaus is talking about there is almost out of scope for us in the sense that it's really up to that piece of code that's doing the conversion from binary to structured to make that decision on its own. And whether it made the right choice or not isn't for us to decide. Yeah. Well, but my point was that the choice is lost over this chain. But that's but but that's but that's up to that person that wrote that bridge, right? We we can't control what kind of logic is in a bridge. All we can control is something like Lance's question, which is, do I treat this this binary blob as a JSON string? And I, and I'm I've, I've convinced myself that no, they asked for it to be passed along as data as binary. Therefore, you need to pass it along as binary to the receiver. But that doesn't that doesn't exist, right? There is no binary blob if it's in the data field. No, no, I'm talking about Lance's scenario, which is it, it's in the, it's in the, um, it's in the, bind, it's in the, bait, I'm sorry, database 64, whatever, whatever that yeah. thing's called. An in incoming message with database 64 set. I, I'm, I think I'm leaning towards that too, Doug, and I need to go back and change my PR. Um, uh, that, that like that, well, someone mentioned earlier the intent. I think it was you, Clements. Like, what is, what is the, the person or the, system that's creating an event, they're creating an event with a certain intent. And if that intent is that the data is binary, it doesn't matter what the 
content type is. If they express it as binary, we should leave it as binary. I think that's the safest of nothing else. Yeah. In the Golang SDK, if you had a structured message as with a database 64 and you converted that and tried to send it out as a, a binary message, it would use the contents of that buffer and write it out as the payload of the body. The contents of the binary data. Yeah, because uh, the base 64 encoded data inside of database 64 would get turned into bytes in a in memory buffer. That buffer would be flushed out as the payload of the body of the, the binary message. And that sounds right. Mm -hmm. Now, the receiver could turn that into a structured message. And if it happens to be JSON, it doesn't know that the intent of the original sender was that the, the data that is base 64 encoded, actually, I want that to stay binary. It would convert that to uh, likely data with a, J a JSON object. Because we don't have a signal to say, actually, this was this OG event was a uh, binary database 64 thing. Because, you know, on the other side, after it goes binary, it's going to look at the data content encoding and uh, try its best. Uh, Ryan, your hands up. Yeah, th this, um, this, this might be a, a bit of a, a rabbit hole um, or, or a bit too pedantic, but I was trying to think of an example. Avro is an interesting example because Avro actually has two representations. It has a JSON representation and it also has a binary representation. Um, so I'm wondering if, if that's an interesting use case to look at where you might have receivers that for whatever reason uh, uh, or producers that can't operate uh, uh, on the binary representation versus um, you know, the structured JSON representation. Anybody want to comment on that? Okay, Jim, uh, your hand is up. I, I think this is a good discussion. I, and I, I'm wondering if we need, is this an SDK issue? or is this a general um, best practice issue? Because not everybody's going to use SDKs, yeah, you know, rightly or wrongly. Um, so do we need to sort of codify these sorts of cases somewhere? My opinion, I think this would be excellent information for the primer. Okay. Once Lance decides what the right answer is. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I, it sounds like we're sort of, um, it sounds like we're sort of agreed that if, if, you know, if the client says send it as binary, then you send it as binary. If, 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 if a receiver gets binary, then it's presented up to the application as binary. You know, the, those um, SDKs that are facing the client or the application code, um, are not going to try and monkey around with um, representations to that extent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then when you have these translation uh, or transformation um, scenarios of structured to unstructured or whatever, um, structured to binary rather, sorry, um, that's where these sort of principles, I think, come into play. Um, I'm not seeing anybody else's hand up. So to wrap this up, Lance, would you be willing to take an action item to write a paragraph or so for the primer? Uh, sure. Yeah. That'd be excellent. Thank you so much. All right. So let's go down here. Perfect. Any other questions or comments about that topic? That was a good one, Lance. I liked it. Hey. Got us thinking. <laughs> yeah, thanks for all the, the, the good commentary. Yep. Okay. Um, okay, this one, <laughs> this one at first, uh, Grant, you're on, right? Yeah. So Grant, when you first opened this one, I thought this was going to be a trivial little thing that I could treat as a typo. Um, Grant, why don't you introduce this one? Because I'm not convinced which way to go on this one. So I'll let you talk to it. 
Yeah. Um, so following the base 64 confusion and dialogue, which I think was great, um, I was trying to understand it as well. And um, just reading that paragraph, let me pull it up. It's on the screen if you can't see it. Yeah, cool. Yeah, uh, so it's under the handling of data. Um, and uh, so, so it reads, if the implementation of the, that, uh, the type of data is binary, the representation must be stored in this data uh, base 64 key. Um, otherwise, if it's um, data, then it must be in data. So I, I thought it made a little bit more sense, especially in the first case where uh, data is not in uh, in like code quotes because I think it's trying to represent data in terms of um, just the concept of a cloud event data field, which might be in base64 and so so yeah, I made the PR to remove the quotes because we also use the code quotes uh, right after in the member name. That's pretty much the summary. OK. Yeah, I, I got to be honest with you. I don't know why this one, but, uh, I need to bring this up, but because I, I think you're probably right. But I wanted to hear from other people who are more English majory type thing, like I'm going to pick on Scott, because you've done this stuff in the past. So Klaus, your hand's up. <laughs> yeah, so um, I, I think that's actually just a leftover, because data was an attribute earlier. and I think in the last weeks before we, we did the 1.0 uh, release, uh, I rewrote some of this to make it clear. Maybe I just, it's, it's probably really just a leftover. And I, I agree that this change makes it a bit more clear. Okay. Anybody read this and disagree with removing the back ticks around the word data in those two spots? Okay. Thank you all. I, like I said, I don't know why this one got me concerned, but I want to make sure I didn't uh, just blindly accept it. Okay. Um, just double check. You opened this when? When did you open this? 18 hours ago. Tell you what. Um, yeah, I'll wait till Friday to make sure no one else brings up any issues with it, um, since technically it was opened up after Tuesday. But if no one mentions anything by Friday, we'll go ahead and merge it. Okay. So thank you, cool. for noticing that. Um, now I know. Slinky is not on the call, but Clemens, I think there was some back and forth on this issue. You want to summarize where things are with this one since you've at least been part of it? Yes, I actually made a comment today in, into, this, into the PR. I imagine that I did some work. Um, <laughs> there we go, there we go. Uh, that was this, um, uh, oh, he already made change, amazing. Um, so I said, I, I think last time we discussed this, I, I said this section seems a little iffy. And uh, I still think it's iffy to have different sub protocols um, for different um, encodings. But when I looked at the W3C interface, that's that link um, that I have in that comment. If you would cl click that once, if you do me the favor. I'm sorry, this one? Yeah. Okay, sorry, I was, I was distracted by something. Okay. Um, so you can only, you can, the, the WebSocket interface as it's, as it's defined in the browser where I find the WebSocket um, uh, interface most useful. Um, you can't give any of the fancy other headers and you can't say here's the extension and that's what I would usually use. Um, but you can really only give a protocol. So they have the WebSocket interface that's in the browser is dumbing this down quite a bit. And so that's really our only option to go and make wishes. Um, and so you would, in this interface, you would say, I'm willing to use the protocol cloudevents.json, comma, cloud, or yes, cloudevents.json, comma, cloudevents.avro. And then the, um, the server will then, you know, negotiate uh, whatever it can. Um, and so that's the, 
that's ultimately what we can, what the constraints are for for the change. And so I I agree with Slinky that using the 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 sub protocol is right. Okay. And then, and then but um, for um, oh okay, if you can can you uh, go to because he's he's updated this five hours ago. Um, Which section should I go to? Uh, we're it's fairly far down, um, right there. Yep. So frame type, text, and binary. So that was that's what I was looking for. So now I'm now would be would be happy with uh, with the spec as it is. That was my only only objection that I had. The rest is basically just the 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 necessary things you have to do and say to you know make the mapping work. It's it's really just ultimately it's just. You know, put structured events onto um, uh, uh, WebSocket frames, and the rest is all just explaining what it is. Okay, now, Thomas, you made a comment here. Um, yeah. Did you did you want to talk to your comment at all? I know Slinky's not on the call, but did you want to talk to it? Yeah, I'm happy to. Uh, so when I read through it, actually today, sorry about that. Um, I was wondering why. Uh, first of all what do you mean by all implementations so was it was it meant to be the client and the server side or the intermediary or, or whatever is, is meant by this but i think this is a phrase which comes from the other protocol bindings as well and then the second thing was why does the json event format uh, is necessarily to be supported or, or why do we act explicitly say this needs to be supported? But maybe okay. you can uh, also say something about this. Yeah. Clement, do you have any opinion on that one? No. <laughs> <laughs> Okie dokie. Oh, oh, wait, um, hang on. So, so, um, ah. Uh, because we, we, I think we mandate that JSON must be supported anyways. In the main so, site, so, I, I, yeah. So for cloud events, you have to support okay. JSON. Okay. Well, if that is somewhere, then then I'm fine with this. I'm, I'm just, was just a bit confused about the all implementations, but probably yeah. it's meant really the client and the server, and then I'm fine with it. I think we have this exact same clause in the main spec. Uh, we can go and look it up, but, but yeah, I was a bit confused. Everybody has to go and support JSON. Yeah, I was a bit confused because here we're talking about web sockets, and, and, and it might be a little bit a different uh, level than than just a normal yeah. HTTP, where we where you would expect uh, text. But here we can choose to switch to binary, and then, but yeah, it's... I'm not so concerned about this. Mm -hmm. And we're really mostly talking about frameworks and we're not, we're, so that might be the unclear piece. Okay. Um, so I don't think you have to use JSON in your application. Mm -hmm. no, I understand that, that every implementation needs to implement it. So it's actually ready. And, and for interoperability point of view, yeah, fully, that's, that's, I'm fully in. And then okay. the, the second, and comment was really about the JSON batch format. So there it, it's written, it contains the WebSocket message contains a cloud event. And then I was thinking, hmm, JSON batch format, which is uh, defined in the JSON format, is this supported as well? And I probably this, this uh, formulation needs to be adapted a little bit. So it could either contain a cloud event or a, an array of cloud events. Okay. It sounds like that's more of a clarification kind of thing, right? It's a minor thing. Yeah. Okay. So I guess for you, Thomas, and you, Clemens, if these two questions here, Thomas, that you opened up are addressed, it sounds like you, both of you guys are okay with this thing moving forward? Sure. Okay. Clemens, you're okay with it moving forward? Yeah. Or do you, did you, did you have reservations? I couldn't. I wasn't one hundred percent clear on whether you had reservations or not. I'm, I'm, I'm fine with it. Okay, cool. All right. Anybody else on the call? 
have any questions or concerns that we need to uh, relay over to Slinky? Okay, cool, making forward progress, that's good. All right, um, tell you what, since we're running out of time, let's skip this one that I was hoping we'd be able to get to. Grant, this issue that you were typed in here, is this a SDK question or a spec question? Just trying to figure yeah. out which phone call we should discuss it on. It's not, not a spec, it's SDK. Okay, so, so we can save that for the next call. Yeah. Okay. Okay, in that case, since we do have a whopping five minutes or so, who opened up this one? John opened up this one. So, okay, I'll let you guys, I'll let you guys read this right here. So to me, I don't actually think we need to do anything in the spec in this space <clears throat> because the spec in pretty much all the key places say, if the, either the value here, if it's present, especially for optional ones, it, oh, I'm sorry, I'm not phrasing this right. For optional attributes, in almost every single case we say, if it's present, it can't be things like a non-empty string, which implies it can't be null. Um, and all the required attributes are defined to be values that can never be the null value. For example, timestamp can't be null, right? It has to conform to some RFC or something like that. So I'm not sure this is actually an issue, but I wanted to bring this up because I think Clemens and uh, Klaus, you guys, and ooh, Lance too, you guys all had comments on this space. So let's, I wanted to get a brief discussion on this to see what everybody's thinking. Who want, does anybody want to go first? I do, I do. Okay, go Scott. <laughs> so there are some bad actors in the ecosystem that uh, do send down payloads that have JSON nil values. Clements. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so, so integration no. test grid sometimes. When I was young, when I was young, <laughs> <They're>... <laughs> well, Kelvin, we don't want to go that far back in time, okay? But go ahead. <laughs> uh, well, so, see, when you have you have strongly typed schemata, schematized records, like in a database or or in the program language, um, the the way how you say there is no value in this thing is not. So that's that's how I, that's how I look at it. Like you create a you create a database table that contains a cloud event. Right. The only way how you can say that field has no value is by putting null into it. But we fast forward 40 years and- <laughs> Only 40, okay, go ahead. <laughs> no, sorry, I, like it's, it's a, I don't know how to handle nils in properties because the, the, the cloud event spec says it must be a thing, it must have a value. And yeah. it's not the string nil that uh, I'm getting, it's, it's the, the JSON nil, which doesn't translate, like that's, that translates to a null pointer in Go. Yeah, but you, since so you can treat, if, if the value is absent, you can treat the, the indicator null as you're, pu as you're pulling the value off the wire. Um, you will see that in the JSON there is a, is a null value, which means you can go and ignore that field completely. You don't have to map it into anything in your, in your, in your Go um, in memory representation. The, the Go marshallers don't know how to do that. They'll do that for pointer types, but if, if, the, if you're trying to marshal something that's a string and it gets a, a JSON value of nil, it just blows up. So, Clemens, I'm... The first one you're having is defective. <laughs> Jem, your hand's up first, I'll, then, then I have my up. I just... Uh... I'm just interested in an example here because the, nil is a string, so it is a valid value. It, it's not semantically valid, but it is a string. No, the, there's a special JSON nil, uh, N U L L. Right. Quotes. Right, but we're talking in what context? What attribute value are we talking about here? Well, in, in the case that I've run into it, uh, test grid sends or sorry, event grid sends uh, certain extensions that it expects, uh, but it doesn't have set as uh, some nil values. And my SDK had a little trouble with that one. So, in, so my, go ahead, sorry, I, I just push on this. So, as an HTB header with the word with the string of nil or null, I think it was structured in a structured. 
if it came in as a header, that would actually work right. because it'd be the string again of nil, and I could just treat it as a the string nil, but it was coming in as a JSON object nil. Oh, okay. Well, that's an invalid, isn't it? Because it's not a string. I, yeah. you, that should fail to parse, I would have thought. That's exactly Valid right. according to the spec. Well, let me, that, I, okay, wait, wait, my hand's up. So let me ask the question to Clemens, since we're picking on you here. What does this sentence mean to you? If present, it must be a non-empty string. To me, an attribute with a value of null or nil, whichever your favorite language is, is present. I don't think it's present. You, really? Null, null, is a way, null is a way to say there is no value here, which means it, it, it is not there. That, that's that's, my, that's my, my, my read of the, the utility of null is to say, there is literally nothing here, which means you can ignore it, but it's still there for structural reasons. Okay, we may have to talk one more about this. Like, Ryan, it, it, in, go ahead. It, go ahead, it's fine. It's fine. No, it, go ahead and finish, Clemens, it's okay. Yeah, so, so, so if, you have a strongly if you have a strongly typed object, or if you have a database table, Right, you can't make you can't make the property go away in the strongly typed object, and you can't make the column go away in the database table. But if you say nobody said anything here, which means the field is absent, you you use now. We have the special we have now a special case in in some and and the same is true for for would be true if we were expressing our events in um, strongly typed in. In Proto or in Avro, any of those those models which prefer strong typing, we made other choices here because we want to have the flexibility. But but otherwise, just null just says it's not there. Okay, um, Ryan, you're going to get the last word on this one. Yeah, I I, I think um, the more restrictive we are in our uh, client implementations, the more assumptions we're making about how all of the upstream producers work. Um, and I, um, I, I think just for robustness sake, um, I would prefer to um, make them handle these cases as gracefully as possible. Um, unless there's a really good reason um, that we can um, quantify uh, that something like, you know, this, this is going to create more garbage. I, I'm not convinced of that. Um, uh, but I, I just prefer to err on the side of, handling these cases gracefully than being draconian. Okay. And with that, we're going to have to call it a day on that one. Uh, obviously it's not over yet. We'll have to discuss it because I'm either way. I think we may need to put something into the spec or primer to talk about this particular case, whether it's to reinforce what some people believe is already in the spec or it needs to loosen things up to allow for null be, to be interpreted as empty. I think something may need to be said. So that's, it's a good thing that someone brought it up. So let me go ahead and do the roll call and then we can move over to the SDK call. Um, so let's see, I heard Grant. Okay, so Ken has vanished. Uh, Matthew, are you there? Um, yes, are you on the call? Matthew? Okay, he I heard- He typed it in chat that he was here. Oh, what's he? Oh, excellent, thank you. Appreciate that. Um, Manuel, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Excellent, Daniel? I am here. Excellent. And Yuzhal? I'm not sure how to pronounce that. I apologize if I'm butchering it. Yeah, it, that is perfect. Yeah. Okay. This okay. is the first time I'm joining. Cool. Well, welcome. Excuse Which company me. are you with, by the way? Sorry? Which company are you with, if you want to be associated with the company? Yeah, yeah. I'm uh, working for uh, Freedom Mortgage. Freedom Mortgage. Okay, cool. I'll figure that out later. Thank you very much. And there was a phone number. Oh, they're gone. Never mind. Okay, did I miss anybody for roll call? No, Doug, I think you need to uh, moderate the next presidential debate, though, because you're pretty good. <laughs> Lord, let's not get into politics. <laughs> <laughs> it was interesting, though. I'll give them that. All right. So yeah, if you not... handle things better, that's all I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that. You guys are much nicer. We'll put it that way. Um, okay. So if you're not interested in the SDK call, feel free to drop. Have a good rest of your day. And then... Um, actually, I should ask while we're switching over, where's my SDK thing? Here we go. So do we have any other topics to talk about on the SDK call? Because if not, we can end the call really quickly. Anybody have anything? So, uh, I can move over the topic. Oh, gosh darn it, I forgot. <laughs>
Sorry, Grant. I uh, completely forgot about you. I apologize. Here we go. Do, do, do. Take too long. Yep. Okay. We why don't you go ahead? Was, what was that, Clemens? We have one governance issue, probably. Do we? Oh, that's right. You, yeah, your, your issue. Okay, we'll talk about that later. All right, Clarence, why don't you go ahead and introduce your question? Okay. Yeah. Um, so, just for context, um, so I'm, I'm working on uh, creating lots of samples for uh, using cloud events with a new API, um, and uh, in our documentation, like we have a lot of copy and pasteable samples, different programming languages, so folks can get started. Um, and yeah, some of these samples use the SDK, some don't, for various different reasons. Um, and I noticed like with the SDKs uh, themselves, um, some of the repos like JavaScript, Ruby, Python um, have like full samples in the start um, that you can just copy and paste and get started, um, especially if like you don't know about uh, cloud events or or sort of, it's sort of not not the focus of the product. But uh, some uh, SDKs don't, and so I was wondering like, do we want to consistently like have samples in our README? Um, should I point developers to our readmes, or is that really not the best place? Um, and so yeah, sort of trying to get thoughts. And then um, maybe we can add PRs to add the samples okay. if we want to do that. Okay. Anybody want to comment on that? Is, is this request uh, attempting to bypass the, the PR and issue process grant? Because you've you've raised issues in the SDKs and you're not getting traction, and it, this feels like you're trying to go around that process. Uh, no, I, I'm. I mean, I'm. I'm wondering if like other people, other, like I don't know, other companies like have links to to. Uh, so like I, I raised an issue like with the Go SDK, um, and I think I created a PR uh, of like there's not a um, sample you can just like copy and paste like the other SDKs. So so I was wondering like I mean, is this something that's truly like not useful for other people or uh, I'm not trying to bypass the process of course. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm a little confused. <laughs> um, I'm very confused by the question. This sounds to me like uh, it's a question of what's expected in our read needs and what can uh, company, company. Daniel, you're, you're cutting out there, unless it's just me. Not, Daniel? Not you, you okay. Out for everyone. Yeah. Daniel, you you there? Okay. Hopefully, Daniel will be able to come back. Um, I guess I, I'm confused. Uh, can Google expect that uh, the readme's will consistently list uh, X, Y, and Z so that Google's own documentation doesn't have to do that? That I think that's what I'm hearing. Okay. Is that so, correct? so Daniel, Daniel, for about thirty seconds there, you went silent. You may want to repeat it again. Sorry. Uh, Hang on just a moment. Okay. Yeah, I, I think that like the last bit was sort of a good summary. Of, like, well, where, where do we want these samples to live? Um, so like, yeah, so Google's gonna have our own documentation of like how to get started with a hello world basic minimal sample. Um, or, or can we have like some of these Hello World samples be in the SDK themselves. Um, so I guess, but I think that's where I'm a little confused. Um, are are people trying to like do PRs to add samples to the SDKs, and they're getting pushback? I I, 
I find it hard to believe that SDKs would reject samples. That's, that's why I'm a little baffled. No, Grant is making issues to ask to produce those, those in the README. Sorry, can you hear me now? Is this yeah. better? Yeah. Um, so I, I guess I, what I was saying is I, what I'm hearing is that uh, uh, we're, we're asking what, whether there's a, a, a specific set of things that we're, we can expect from all of the readmes so that uh, when, Google, when something like that Google asks or, or directs developers to uh, our readmes uh, and says, you're use cloud events for, for these reasons, it can expect that the readmes will contain what is cloud events, here are examples and, uh, and you know, lists of A, B, and C so that Google's own documentation doesn't have to repeat that. It can expect that the samples are, so is there some kind of uh, 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 consistent list of things that we can expect from this. So is, I, that's what I'm hearing from from Grant. Is that is that correct? So yeah. it's more so it's more like uh, you know do do we have like a standard for our readme's rather than you know we, yes we can uh, request uh, specific uh, you know things in, pull, in individual pull requests, but if we don't. Uh, have an overall uh, expectation, then you know, individual pull requests can go out of date. They can be inconsistent. Uh, can we can we coordinate all of this? I guess. Okay, so actually, who are somebody? I don't know who pasted this, but let's take a look yeah. at this issue. So yeah, I created a GitHub issue and then provided like some sample code of what uh, down below, like of what would be nice. But I guess. It depends, like, yeah, I guess it depends on, like, what we want. Um, I mean, do we want, uh, but I, I guess, uh, should we assume some proficiency in, like, the programming language um, or, like, getting started? If you go scroll down a bit, like, more tangentially, um, if we can have, like, I was thinking like this type of code snippet and then read me, that would solve for Go. There's a whole directory full of many, many, many examples that are full that compile. I guess with, with the samples directory, like there's no instructions of how to use those samples. Yeah, it needs more, more documentation, but I don't think that this particular copy and paste is helpful because you either you're you're new to go and you don't understand and you're not going to get it from this because you need to go in it and all this other stuff or you already know go and you don't need something that looks like this so so grant are you so grant are you suggesting that <clears throat> while we have picking on the go sdk it, while we have samples in the go sdk and as Scott said, maybe there's some additional documentation that needs to be created. Are you saying that while those are nice, it would be better to have in the actual main readme full snippets of code itself? I mean, maybe maybe for the Go like Go SDK, like it's just we point to the samples HTTP folder, and like there's more, there's like right now there's there's no like readmes or or getting started guides. In the samples folder, so maybe we just point there. I mean, it doesn't necessarily have to be in like the README, but um, just, like like having a. I mean, I mean, I can imagine like having a cons consistent way for new developers to get started in in five minutes with the SDK to be something that we sort of expect for every language. Okay, because I, I can't. No, no, no. We have ahead, so much documentation. We have a whole website that's dedicated to the Go SDK for cloud events. Go, go to the. Doug, can you navigate to the main README? Do, 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 do. Come on, there you go. And then scroll down to the going further. Do, 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 do. Yep, go on. And then click on look. Look at the complete documentation. Bam! Click that guy. Okay, I guess I didn't. And then if you go back to the README, <laughs> there's dig into the GDoc. Cool, that's, that's cool. And then check out the samples page. 
So I don't know what more you need. We've tried really hard to make it easy for people to get started. I guess that's where my confusion kind of comes from too. Um, is what is, because Grant, I, I'm, I'm trying to understand what, what's missing either from this or if it's that you've come across other SDKs where they're not as thorough as, as what Scott is presenting here. Um, because I, I just, I, I find it hard to believe that if you open up an issue, I'm sorry, if you open up a PR to add additional documentation someplace, I can't imagine one of the SDKs would actually say no, unless the argument is, well, it's not necessarily appropriate to put all that into a readme as opposed to a dedicated samples directory like Scott was pointing to. I could see an argument there, right? You don't want the readme to get too big or something, right? I, that, that makes some sense. I'm just trying to figure out what the next actionable thing here is that you're looking for. Yeah, I, I guess I, I didn't see the, um, the like uh, github.io page uh, going further. Um, I mean, in terms of the action I was proposing, um, which is right now in, in the GitHub issue, uh, not in a PR, was just having that sample. But I guess we have the sample in the going further. Yeah, plus the, the having this text is full of foot guns for Go because you need to understand how to get it up and going. You, have, you need to have modules or you need to have it locally or you need to turn modules off. And I don't want to explain all that. So what's the next step here, Grant? Uh, I mean, I, I was mostly looking for discussion. Um, I think we're going to have like separate um, tutorials and, and stuff for, it depends on each language. Um, I mean, well, what's interesting though is, I mean, there, there is one thing. I, I don't remember for you, um, for sure, whether it was you or Daniel said something along the lines of, should there be some consistency across the SDKs? And in general, you know, consistency is nice, sure. Um, whether we need to be formal about it and say in the SDK dot markdown document says every SDK must have X, Y, Z in this particular order or this particular format. We, we could certainly explore that as an option if that's what people want. Um, but I, I'm, I'm not sure whether, that, whether that's reducing the freedom that each SDK team wants to do the right thing for their own project. Now, if we come across one SDK that is slacking and they have poor documentation, poor examples, and the thing is completely unusable except by the people that wrote it, then I think that's a separate issue and we should bring that up and say, this guy, you know, say, you know, guys, this is not being maintained properly. Something needs to happen here. But whether we need consistency across the SDKs, that's something worthy of a discussion. I just don't know whether any, how people feel about that. I mean, do people feel like we need to have that level of consistency across the SDKs relative to documentation and samples? I mean, I, 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 don't, I don't think they need to be, they, they need to be the same. Okay. Grant, were you gonna say something in there as well? Yeah, yeah I mean, uh, uh, you, they don't need to be the same. Like every language is very different. Um, I guess, like from a user perspective, um, if we link all the like, I guess, I guess when we we're preparing docs, we were just linking to the SDK readmes for getting started and. And I don't think that would provide like a uniform experience right now. But, but yeah, I mean, the more I think about this, I think I don't think there needs to be really any changes. Um, okay, because 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 my, my suggestion would be two things. One is if, as you said, you you guys want to point to the SDK readmes as the place to go for documentation so you guys don't have to duplicate it 
inside Google, and that makes perfect sense to me. So if one particular SDK's README or samples, whatever you want to call it, isn't good enough for a novice to come in, then I think that's a problem in general. And we should get PRs opened against those SDKs to beef up their documentation and samples. I think that that's that's a given, right? Because every 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 SDK needs to be good enough to be used by a novice user. I think once the SDKs are at at an appropriate level, right, where they're all good enough, then I think it's fair to come back and say, "Hey, I've been looking at all the SDKs." And they all kind of have the same information, but they present it in a very different way. And this isn't a language difference. This is a stylistic difference, or this is some have, you know, samples embedded in the readme, some have samples directory, you know, or there's just, it, it, and it makes it kind of hard for a user to bounce between them because they're, they're structured so differently that it makes it confusing for people, right? And at that point, I think it's fair to come back and say, I think we should have a consistent approach. And here's my proposal to be consistent. What do you guys think about being consistent on the SDKs? But I think it's, it'd be fair to, I think it'd be fairer to have that discussion after we do the first step, which is make sure each SDK at least have, has appropriate level of documentation in their readme, right? So I, if I were you, I'd focus on that first so that you guys don't have to duplicate it in Google, then come back and say, look, the inconsistency is really annoying from a user perspective, because that's a concrete thing that we can deal with. Does that make any sense? Uh, yeah, I mean, because I'm not, I'm not hearing a whole lot of excitement about out of the gate mandating consistency across SDKs, and I, and I think if you wanted to get there, we may be able to get there at some point in the future. But I think we first need to take the first step of forget about consistency. Do we even have the right documentation? Right, even if it's inconsistent. Well, we made a choice that every SDK, is, it, it has some minimum level of stuff, but it's idiom, idiomatic in the language and how the, those modules are presented. If, if everything had to start from, okay, let me teach you about Java. Uh, if every library had to do that, it'd be, the ecosystem would be insane. Yeah, and I don't think, I, hopefully no one wants that, but at least if one, S, yeah, but, but if one SDK went really farther than all the others in terms of educating people. Like for example, let's say they did that insane thing and I said, hey, I'm gonna teach you Java, right? Then at least we can look at that SDK and say, man, those guys are nuts that they did that. There's no way in heck we're gonna do that for Go. Or we could look at that and say, hey, you know what? We're getting tons of praise from Java. We should do that for all of them, right? But at least, at least then we can have a discussion and compare the SDKs because they're inconsistent and say, you know what? Let's make them all consistent and what they did over there is really, really good. And we have a concrete example of, of something to look at. Right now, I don't feel like we're at that point to even have that discussion. I'd rather focus on the immediate problem of, is the documentation in any particular SDK good enough? And if not, let's get someone to open a PRs to fix it. And so Grant, that's why I'm, I, I'm kind of coming back to you and say, look, if you found as you're doing your work that some particular SDK, if their documentation is not good enough, open some PRs against that to get that fixed and not necessarily worry about your higher order question of consistency yet. We can work on that later if that, if that becomes an issue. Once you complete your exercise of all the SDK documentation being good enough for that SDK in isolation. Does that make any sense yep. at all? I mean, yeah, I mean, I, uh, I guess I like for, for the, not, not to pick on the Go SDK, but like, is it reasonable? I guess, like, do other folks want to have, uh, we're, we're not expecting anybody to teach like Go fundamentals, but just to like uh, have one tutorial or, or one one page that like complete completely sets up an application and and starts a server. I don't I don't think there uh, exists. Make a tutorial uh, as a separate markdown, and we can link from the README. I'd be happy to accept it. Okay, I guess like some of the other languages have the tutorial-ish thing inside the main 
read me. But but do they have yeah, I, this like twenty examples of of how to use the SDK? Scott, I'm I'm not picking about the SDK itself. I'm I'm just I'm really just trying to get this use case. Um, well, if you want traction, here, here's my advice: is uh, PRs over issues gets work done. Yes, I, I I know that. My I was first. I have a specific the specific code that I add in a PR in the GitHub issue. Um, uh, but I think there was like, like my proposal was to add, add that, although I don't, as you said, I don't think we want to, well, I, I don't know. I, I would be fine adding that specific sample and and the command line steps right below. Except that command line step isn't isn't correct because now you, you also need to tell them that they need to make that into a, a certain file called hello. Yep. Yeah, you, you need to init your project and and, and write it in a file. Um, not do it inside the checkout of the Go SDK. There's just like there's a ton of gotchas that uh, somebody that is trying to test out Go for the first time is going to hit, and someone that's used Go for uh, more than you know two tries would never even think about it anymore. And you need to you need to have Go from from the start. So I, I'm I'm and that, that using that's every, a pure. Every, I use I use Go um, very rarely, and um, yeah, I'm not I'm not sure I'm not sure this would help me all that much because I would I would rather have a snippet that I, that explains how that works, and then I would if I didn't have a sample uh, to look for and I would always look for the samples, um, then I would go and just create a, a baseline Go app somewhere else and and then go and try to try to put that in, but I. Yeah, I'm. I would always, I always, always go for the samples and 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 see what the samples are. But I, I would, I would look this to be informed, but then would always jump to the samples. So, so Graham, maybe you should do a PR to show what you're thinking of in terms of how to change the GoLang SDK, whether it's yeah, just a you know large change to the README, or whether it's a tutorial directory that that that, that really hands hold a person from nothing to a front and go program and you point to that from the readme, you know, that's your your call. But maybe a PR would help solidify the discussion and make it less abstract. Yes, sounds good. Okay. I think. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Thank you, sir. Thanks. Yep. All right, Clemens, let's talk yeah. governance. Yeah. Um so I, I finally found someone who can help with the C-Sharp SDK, um, who is unfortunately sick and couldn't join today. Um, but so our Josh Love, who works in the, um, in the Azure SDK team, has volunteered to um, help out with the C-Sharp SDK because John Skeet fell. Um, so, we, so we fixed this organizationally. Now comes the governance question. Um, I would like to I would I would like to give up my um, committer status and give that to Josh um, because it's basically just a swap within the company. But um, I'm not sure that works with the current governance rules. Um, and the question is, um, are we Apache or are we not? Um, I would prefer if we had. Um, if we had a rule that allows us to swap places with the company um, rather than um, uh, and, and have a vacation rule, et cetera, um, rather than um, uh, you know, binding this to people. Um, and, and of course, if three people, for, if three people from, from Google or three people from, from Red Hat are working um, on, um, on a particular SDK, uh, because of the level of engagement, because you know they fulfilled those, they fulfilled the criteria, 
that's perfectly fine. Um, but then it should be possible for any uh, any of the three of them to go on vacation and nominate someone else who can go and, and do the work or you know, if they get sick or whatever, so that there's still three people from Google being able to go and work on this. That's that's my that's that's the goal that I have here. Okay. So my, also, my, my, my tactical goal is for Josh to be able to work uh, work um, as a committer, um, basically immediately taking over from me. Okay. Now, I know Slinky can't be on the call, but I know you and he did have a conversation in Slack, and I apologize, I didn't get a chance to read it. Could you channel your best Slinky to see what that, what that conversation was like <laughs> between the two of you? Um, there was, a, yeah, so he, is, he he wanted to, things to be a little bit more like Apache. <laughs> um, and um, I think he mostly misunderstood my intent that I had. Like, uh, I didn't want to... I didn't want to make it like one company, one developer. That's I think that's what he understood. Um, and uh, because he said, you know, I didn't have, I, I've had a hard time finding traction with others. And now if we have multiple people from Red Hat, then then that's what it's going to be. Um, and that's, I think that's that's very reasonable. And I didn't want to preclude this. What I wanted to, what, what I don't like about the Apache model is that, um, a, and this is what happens in the Apache project is that some VC funded company shows up and rotates their entire staff through uh, the project. And now, even though only four people are factually working on it, they have a super majority of 50 people with committer status who will go and basically just dominate the project on votes. And so that's something that I want to, that, that's something that I want to avoid. Hmm. Interesting. How can you avoid that last scenario? That's interesting. Um, in in that you that every com, every committer slot needs to be needs to be uh, earned, like here. Yeah, but once you earn it, you you basically have it, right? So I mean, I see, I think, maybe, yeah. maybe maybe I misinterpreted what you said. I thought you said you know they'll they'll go through every, all the developers in rotation and they'll spend just enough time to get maintainer status and then they vanish. Yes. Right. I don't know how you avoid that. Well, I, I'm not sure how I can avoid that, but I would, would like to avoid that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so let me ask you this. In your particular case, um, what, what was the guy's name? Josh, right? Josh Love? Yeah. Um, wh what would be... And I'm not, I'm not necessarily pushing back on what you're, what you're suggesting. I'm just playing devil's advocate here. Um, what would be wrong with saying, okay, Josh, I need you to take over. Go ahead and start submitting a whole bunch of PRs as necessary to get the job done. And you come in as the, basically one of the only maintainers in there. I guess John is too, but between, the, between you and John, you'll you know, review and approve the PRs and in short order, he'll become a maintainer because he'll be- yeah, The whole point is that I'm too busy. Yeah, okay. I, I thought you'd say something like that, okay. So my, the point is, the point is that if I if I could be reviewing PRs uh, in a timely fashion always, then uh, we wouldn't be doing that switch. We're literally doing that switch because I I need to get this off my desk, okay. like now. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else want to comment on this? Because it sounds like Clemens is basically asking for a change to the to the governance model to allow for this type of situation. Sure. No one wants to comment? I'll, I'll pick on somebody if I have to. In this particular case, the, the, does Clemens have any backup in the SDK? There's John Skeet, I think is the guy's name. John Skeet from Google. See, what's weird to me about this, Clemens, is I, I kind of see, it, I think it almost depends on the SDK, right? I think if there's an SDK that has lots of different people from lots of different companies active in there, <clears throat> I could see a lot of tension with, with your proposal well, because typically it's, it's not, it's not company based activity, but your SDK is different because for the most part, it's been Microsoft. So it makes yeah. perfect sense that you'd swap out one Microsoft person for another. Right. And that's what I'm struggling with. Yeah. I have the same, I have, I have a similar problem. But I'm also seeing like the, the the there's a there's a date there's a danger I see in general 
like there's a there's some brokenness that I observe in governance elsewhere, and that's not a problem that we can probably solve uh, here today. Certainly not. Yeah. Where um, projects accumulate monta- maintainers, which then also translates into kind of voting rights, kind of on 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 contested issues, where um, if you can stop the project su- successfully and you can have uh, 80 people on it, just by rotating people through, everybody has then, then retains maintainer status and all of a sudden um, they have a super majority where they can cancel out particularly smaller entities. And smaller entities might quite well be, um, because we, amongst us middleware people, right? Um, there are no, there are no five, 200 developers in, in Microsoft who are caring about you know, these kinds of events at the infrastructure level, it's probably 20 or 30, right? So we don't even a VC funded startup, which is making eventing or messaging their only thing and are 2000 people, mm-hmm. right? And yeah. so, so even, even though we're the trillion dollar company, um, you know, we, we run there, we run, we run far tighter ships on those things. So there's there's a there's a there's a natural ill distribution, and then and then individuals um, are even in a worse situation because they they I mean they, they try to contribute, but then they get steamrolled by by companies which are just rotating their entire staff through it, mm-hmm. and and so the, my my question here is that it's perpetual across everything. It's like how can you avoid that sort of abuse because it's keep it keeps happening. Yeah, you know, hey, <laughs> I, I am kind of amused by this because the idea of a company like Microsoft being swamped by a little startup is just ironic. <laughs> it, it is ironic, but it happens. I know, I know. It's just funny. It, it doesn't. It doesn't only happen. It doesn't only happen to us, right? It happens to Red Hat. It it happens to it happens to Google. It happens to Amazon. It happens to it. It, it kind of happens to everybody. Yeah. We're, we're we're like. Whoa! Yeah, no, I, I I totally agree with you. It's just it's just amusing to me because you know yeah, in our it, past it, it, standard it, it, state. Go ahead. Yeah, it is. No, I was just gonna say in our past standards days, it was always the exact opposite, right? It was always IBM, Microsoft, the, you know, the worlds would dominate those groups, and and now we're hearing about little startups doing it to us. It's it's just amusing, yeah, um, but I also, but I also agree with you that I, I've always thought that that there should be some rule for maintaining your maintainership, right? Like you have, it, you know, you, have, you earn, a certain number of PRs means you get to be nominated to be a maintainer. Well, in order to keep that maintainership, it seems like you should have a constant stream of PRs going as well. You can't just vanish and hold on to for five years. That doesn't seem right either to me. Yeah, and I think, I think there's a, some TTL on your, on your, um, uh, but the TTL that needs to, I mean, this needs to get complex, right? Because sometimes software is just sits there and it's done. True. And then how do you measure this? Right. Okay. So let, let's get a little more concrete here in terms of the problem. So it seems to me we may need to take the situation into account. And I don't know how we're going to do it in terms of changes to the governance stock, but it does seem like the situation you brought up is valid. And unless someone on the call or in the group, I guess I should say, vehemently disagrees and, say, and wants to say, Clemens, you're full of it. If, if Josh wants to be a maintainer, he needs to do this time and do PRs. Um, unless someone's going to say that, then I think we need to figure out some way to accommodate this type of situation. Um, and there's two things about that that I think we need to think about. One is changes to the governance doc and how to deal with the sort how to deal with the situation immediately because as you said you need to get this off your plate now yeah, right, right. And, you, and you may not necessarily need to wait for a government stock change so let me let me start with the first question and i need people to be brutally honest here is clemens request invalid and i'm going to pick on the current maintainers that i know are on the call for example scott lance i don't know who else has maintainer rights Daniel, I think you might as well, right? Is his request just insane and we got to say no? no I think he's earned it. The, the new maintainers, the, this is our guidance, but there's also an escalation path. And for an SDK like C Sharp, where 
uh, it might be a little less easy to find C sharp enthusiasts. Um, and the bus factor is now one, it does make sense to promote somebody out of a, a trusted circle. We actually have an escalation process in here. Maybe, maybe not. I'll have to take it a closer look. Okay. Okay. So thank you, Scott. You don't think it's, it's insane, at least in this particular case. Uh, Lance, any thoughts? I tend to agree. I mean, I, I don't think it's insane. There, there needs to be some way to deal with the situation like this, but I am curious about the escalation path that yeah. you mentioned, Scott, that it's in that document. I could have sworn we had something, but I can't see in the mind to find it. Yeah. I, I thought it was like, maybe if there's not any, well, there's this, if the, if the thing is not maintained. Yeah, like, you know, if it's not meeting the criteria, then we hand it over to a new maintainer. Yeah, I think I think it's it's somewhere basically in here, but I'm not even sure that's quite the same scenario because we're not saying that the project isn't being maintained. It's just... Clemens, you just need to, need to walk away from the project for a month or two, <laughs> abandon it, and then it will be not maintained. <laughs> That's one way to do it. <laughs> so, okay. One last person I think might be a maintainer. Daniel, you're a maintainer, aren't you? Yes, I am. I'm the only maintainer of Ruby right now. Um, uh, I think it's, I, I think the, you know, the, this makes complete sense to me. Um, uh, uh, as you know, in, in my case, uh, I'm, I am, I'm a maintainer because uh, uh, Google as a company and its products are have an interest in this in in cloud events, uh, and so it's my job to uh, to make sure that we have a you know a, a reasonable SDK, uh, uh, and so from a company's perspective, it's uh, uh, you know one kind of one it's it's the company that has the interest, not the individual, and so one engineer you know uh, could replace another engineer in, in that in that role and just kind of have the same role from the from the uh, uh, the project's perspective uh, so I that seems to make a lot of sense to me um, uh, yeah okay okay so let's do this since we're running out of time and I'm getting really hungry for lunch um, let's do this just to make sure okay so how do I say this right so technically we're not following the rules here and I'm hearing that people are okay with that because this is a, not only a special case, it makes sense, whatever you want to call it. So let me do this. Let me post a comment in the SDK Slack channel saying, explain the situation, saying it, at least for this particular case, it makes sense. And if I don't hear any objection by say end of day Friday, um, that we're going to go ahead and make Josh a maintainer in the C-sharp SDK. However, we also need to then look at changing the governance doc because I don't like the idea of the governance doc not being accurate to, to match reality, okay? And so I'd like to then have us work on an update to the governance doc to allow for these types of situations. And it could be as simple as, hey, we realize there are gonna be some weird cases that we need to address, like, and here's an example, and we're gonna address those by this way. And maybe it's as simple as just a vote among the, right, the other maintainers to say, yes, this is a special case kind of like what we just did, right? But at least then there's a process that we can follow when something like this does come up again and we don't have to sort of reinvent the wheel each time. Does that sound fair, Clemens, in particular, since you need to bail on this quickly? Yeah. Okay. Anybody else have a comment on that or disagree with that process? Okay. I'll take the action item, as I said, to, to at least get the quick switch over happening through the uh, Slack channel. And then we'll talk about how to change the, the uh, governance stock later. All right, cool. Uh, let's go back over here. Where is the SDK? Do, 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 do. Okay. Anything else you guys want to talk about on today's call? Nope. Anybody else? All right, cool. We are done. Thank you, guys. And we'll talk again next week. What's for lunch? I have no clue. <laughs> <laughs> Food. At this point, I'll take anything. <laughs> All right. Thank you, guys. I'll talk again next week. Have a good one.
Thanks, Doug. All right. Yep. Bye. bye. bye.